Hi everyone and welcome to part three of our three-part video series on Tara June Winch's novel Swallow the Air. Now we've already taken a really good look at the novel so far, looking at its background, its plot and also the way in which belonging is in it. Now we're also going to examine the way in which specific language techniques are used to portray these themes that we've been talking about. And this is the sort of detail that you need to write a really sophisticated, excellent essay. You need to understand the way that this novel is constructed in order to really understand and appreciate what it has to say and what its message really is. So the descriptive passages of the text need to be dissected so that you can understand its plot, characters and themes. It can definitely seem a little bit complicated and overwhelming because it's so poetic in style. However, we're going to go through and look at some examples of how you can pick apart these poetic techniques and write about these in a response. Let's look at some examples of language techniques. One technique which you can be using is the conversational tone. Now, the opening line of the novel is, I remember the day I found out my mother was headsick. The contrast within the same paragraph in this next quote, Mum's sad emerald eyes bled through her black canvas and tortured willowed hair. So basically, if we're examining these two quotes together, they seem like they've almost been written by two completely different authors. One is very conversational and colloquial. For example, the word head sick. And then the next one is really beautiful and emotive and very descriptive. Sort of these words such as the emerald eyes bleeding through the black canvas. So this way in which these two ideas are being taught, compared and contrasted really speaks a lot of what the author is trying to do because she's trying to demonstrate the way in which through moving back and forward between these styles, she can highlight different sections. She's also definitely showing you the hardships facing this Indigenous community, but also showing the way in which having a sense of belonging to culture can make these seem a little bit more manageable. Our personal pronouns are also a technique used in this novel. They're used to demonstrate personal perspective, so they're really a way of making this a very personal text, one which has a very individual message from the author and from her persona of May. So what these allow us to do is identify with Auntie and her hilarious battle to win the tip top grocery grab. So in the quote, we saw her start to panic, you could see the dread. We, you and you are really ways of being very inclusive, drawing the audience in and making them feel like they're part of this funny and action faced scene where the auntie is doing ridiculous running around and grabbing groceries. So really what you're doing is a contrast from that poetic style through that colloquial tone which is coming in through these personal pronouns. This is also a way of balancing humour and that grim reality which the author is obviously dealing with through her work. The next technique which is used is the technique of characterization. This is definitely achieved through the concept of dialogue. Dialogue is something which is quite tricky to write in just because it's quite hard to make it seem realistic. However, Tara June Winch definitely achieves realism through her dialogue and really through excellent dialogue writing, manages to create very distinct characters which we really feel like we can get to know. So her broad Australian idiom and I dialect is used throughout. Basically, I dialect is the concept where you write words as you would say them. So if you take a look at this quote, Garn, get out, go meet your mates. What it's doing is it's writing down in slang, so not using the correct spelling, but really expressing that accent and that culture through the way in which she's presented her words. You also get the idea that May is stoked to be asked to the movies. So all these sort of little bits of interesting colloquial language which she just chucks in into that really beautiful poetic material to make it seem like a very realistic text which is modern, which is up to date, and which sort of teenagers and young people are interested in reading. The informal joking language shows belonging as a family. So it's a really useful way of demonstrating belonging is through the way that they as a family are able to talk and interact through dialogue. So you really get that sense that they're working with each other, they're having conversations and they're finding that sense of belonging through talking. If we look at the technique of dialect, Joyce speaks in a dialect that doesn't respect grammar. So again, we have this concept of idiom or slang where the author is sacrificing correct sort of spelling and grammar in order to more correctly characterize and give a bit of color to her work. 
So this definitely shows Joyce's outsider status through the way that she talks. So this quote, government putting fear on us, not grammatically correct, however really successful in expressing Joy's language through the way in which she speaks and the way in which she interacts with the people around her. Joyce also peppers her conversation with Aboriginal words and sort of slang in that way. For example, moguls and his one talk, his black girl alley. So this is definitely a representation of belonging to Aboriginality. So the language which she uses is really expressive of the fact that she is an Aboriginal and she doesn't want to hide that through her language. She wants to accentuate that through using words which people recognise as very distinctive to that Aboriginal culture. The concept of imaginative language is also used significantly in this work. Tension and crises are heightened and contrasted with imaginative language. For example, when you look at May drifting into this whole drug scene and really violent addictive gang world, we see the fragmented sentence, one step forward, two steps back, no home again. So that really fragmented line, which is suggestive of May's personal struggle. So you're seeing that interaction between language and content. Similes such as, some of us leapt out of windows like high jump horses. So that's an example furthermore of imaginative language and just demonstrates the way in which really beautiful and poetic language is being successfully used in prose to describe a really awful scene. So they're describing people jumping out of windows but doing that in a beautiful way, so high jump horses. So you're getting that beautiful image describing that really harsh reality. The metaphor, they shot paint into the officer's face, his eyes bleeding, his blindness, savages. So that sort of very two sentence structure, including the one word savages on its own, is again very imaginative because you've got this idea of he's not being shot with a bullet, he's being shot with paint. So you get that almost idea that May is hiding through this beautiful descriptive language, perhaps shielding herself from the really grim reality through this beautiful imaginative description. These beautiful and surprising descriptions of awful events and circumstances are quite surprising because we're in a situation where we are hearing about really awful events and also really awful concepts like not belonging and the barriers to belonging and why the Aboriginal people are feeling isolated and neglected. But at the same time, the author is describing it in this really beautiful, imaginative and poetic way. So it's very surprising for the audience and this novel is something which is quite sort of shocking for the first time that you read it. The technique of contrast is also significantly used. So the grim details of harsh lives are contrasted to the Aboriginal dreaming. For example, while in lockup, the idea that the Aboriginal Dreamtime story is included in the text, however, moves from that really very standard conversational prose, um, that really conversational colloquial language of the dialect and the idioms, is now turning into beautiful poetic description. So in a hard situation, using that beautiful Aboriginal culture to survive circumstances which are quite difficult. So if we look at this quote, the stars scattered free and became seabirds, carving lines and unzipping the wet universe. So all those beautiful layers there of description and of imaginative language are really building up to create a lovely image of the way in which not only the dream time can be used as a culturally significant thing, but something which can be used in the present as almost a way of escaping that harsh reality. Personification is also used as a technique, so this allows rich, detailed descriptions of the land. So personification emphasises the importance of May belonging to the land through the fact that the land is really allowed to be brought alive and made seem like a human, even though it's obviously just a piece of land. The river sleeps tree bones of spirit people, arms stretched out and screaming. So that multi-layer of personification there, the river sleeping, the tree bones that are the people, and the tree's arms stretching out and screaming, is a really good way of demonstrating that sense of Aboriginal belonging to land and to nature. The concept of the metaphor is also used to unify and link ideas about belonging and alienation. So the dead stingray that had swallowed its struggle. So you have that indication there that it's metaphorically, but also physically swallowed its hardships in life. You also have the idea that the stingray is an angel fallen lying on its back. 
And this also compares to the description of the aunt later on. This quote, which is an angel laying out her wings beneath the satellites of the sky. So there you have that ongoing metaphor, so it's almost becoming a motif of something being described as angels, which is a symbolic thing, very spiritual, and is very indicative of the idea that the Aboriginal people have a strong sense of spirituality and of the fact that there's something more than flesh and blood, there is something sort of beyond our own world. So now let's examine some further resources which you can use to develop your understanding more. Now because Swallow of the Air is a lesser known work, there is less material online. Basically it's an Australian work and it's quite a sort of alternative work. So there is going to be less material for you to find but there is definitely enough there for you. If you know where to look, there are some excellent resources. You can use study guides which are available to be purchased at bookstores. And additionally, there are a lot of interviews and articles online about Winch's personal journey. And because we discussed that idea that Winch's own story has led to the production of this novel, that's going to be really beneficial for you. So that brings us to the end of our lesson on Swallow the Air. This is the third part in our videos on this subject. And I really hope that you've taken away not only the way in which belonging is traceable in this text, but through understanding more about the historical background and the present day struggle of this culture, and then also looking at some techniques, you can really bring all of these aspects together to produce a sophisticated and excellent essay for your exam.